Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to EMS Stage B. Our next speaker is Andrew Jenner, who's going to be talking about adventures in retro computing. Over to you. Thank you. So this is a, this is a story about some uh, pretty absurd lengths that I, I went to to uh, get an old game running on, on new computers. Um, like, uh, like many of the best stories, uh, this story starts uh, when my parents uh, brought home a, 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 a PC, a, a home computer, into our house for the first time. It was an Amstrad PC-1512, uh, a pretty good PC for the time. It had a, an 8 MHz 8086 CPU, uh, half a meg of RAM, and uh, 16 color graphics, a resolution of 640 by 200. It had a PC speaker that uh, made bleepy bloop music that uh, uh, sounds pretty grating to uh, today's ears. And, um, it, had a, uh, it came with a, a graphical user interface and a mouse, which was, which was the, the hot new thing at the time. Uh, it came with a few bits of software, but uh, we were uh, looking around for, for new things to, to run on it. And uh, somehow got hold of a, a, a disc full of pirated games. And uh, there were a few, few fun games on this, uh, on this disc. There was uh, Willy the Worm and uh, a Frogger clone called Hopper. But our favorite game to play uh, was this one, Digger, by, uh, by Windmill Software. I uh, didn't know anything about it. It didn't come with any instructions or anything. We just had to kind of figure out how to play it as we, uh, as we went along. And uh, it, uh, this game had uh, these sort of fantastic sort of cartoony graphics. It had uh, music that was uh, a little more sophisticated than the, the uh, music in the other games. The uh, uh, programmers were clever enough to be able to uh, make the notes in the background music uh, actually change volume over time. So they, uh, they were nicely shaped with, uh, with envelopes. Uh, we, uh, because we didn't know how to play the game, it was actually some time before we figured out that uh, uh, the F1 key fired a fireball, and you could uh, you could kill the enemies that way. Uh, made it much easier to play once we figured that out. Uh, some years later, we uh, finally uh, got rid of that old machine and upgraded to a, a 486 machine, uh, which uh, came with uh, Super VGA graphics. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Digger did not work on this machine. Uh, it uh, uh, the the programmers had uh, programmed the machine at such a low level that uh, they, they were programming the uh, individual registers on the CGA card. Uh, and VGA is not compatible with CGA to that extent. So if you try to play Digger on a VGA or Super VGA machine, it looks something like this. It's, uh, the display is all corrupted, and uh, you can't see what's going on. It's completely unplayable. And it's also far, far too fast, because the, uh, uh, all the timing in, in Digger was done just by counting CPU cycles. So if your uh, CPU is actually is twice as fast, your, the, the game will play twice as fast. Uh, so a uh, number of years passed, and I uh, had a, a, an idea that I wanted to, to, to fix this, to, to make, it, uh, make it playable on modern machines. And um, I actually went to the, the first thing I did was actually I uh, uh, reverse engineered the, the graphics out of the, uh, the executable file and redrew them in, uh, in VGA resolution. Just for fun, I didn't think I would actually do anything with them at the time. Uh, and then in 1998, I finally got around to decompiling the entire game back to the C code. And uh, I, I believe this is the first time that somebody had, uh, had remastered a, a game in this way. I I've heard of a few other projects since, uh, similar projects uh, with other games. But um, the, uh, as far as I know, I was, the, I was the first person to do that. And if you have any uh, information to the contrary, let me know and I'll... Uh, uh, retract that. But, um, uh, so once I got it back to the C code, I uh, was able to add the VGA graphics that I had drawn into it. Uh, I added uh, uh, Sound Blaster Sound. Uh, I added a few more features, uh, game recording and playback, so that you could uh, show off your high scores to your friends. Uh, a, a mode where two players can play simultaneously and either cooperate or, or fight each other, depending on, on how you want to play it. Um, I added the ability to, to redefine the keys, which um, uh, was kind of useful for people who, whose uh, keyboards didn't work very well with the, uh, 
the keys that it came with, and an exit button. Uh, the original digger, to exit the game, you actually had to re reboot the entire computer, uh, as uh, uh, a number of games did in those days. Uh, there was one part of the game which I never got exactly right, and that was this screen. When you get a new high score, uh, the uh, the original digger would hammer the CGA's palette registers to change the colors of the letters on this, uh, on this screen uh, in a sort of uh, shimmering uh, uh, fashion. And um, uh, because the computer that I had originally played Digger on was not the same speed as the computer that Digger was written on, I didn't know exactly how this screen was supposed to look. Uh, so I wasn't able to, to reproduce it uh, uh, properly. Um, so I just made a, a sort of guess at, what, uh, at, at how I thought it should look. Uh, but it, was, it always kind of bothered me that uh, there was this particularly visible uh, thing that uh, uh, shows that, uh, uh, it, that it was, the, the remake was... was inexact from the, uh, the original in that respect. I guess the, uh, the speed of the game overall was, was also inexact, but that, that seemed less of a concern to me at the time. Now, the answer to uh, uh, this kind of problem is, of course, uh, emulation. The emulator is a, a program that will take a, a, a modern machine and, and uh, teach it to behave like, uh, like an older machine. And uh, there are a number of emulators uh, for emulating old PCs. Um, I, I've actually contributed to a, to a whole bunch of them over the years, uh, 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 adding support for uh, various games and bits of hardware that did uh, did weird things with them. Um, uh, the uh, MES, the Multiple Emulator Super System, which is now part of the MAME Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator, uh, is a, uh, an emulator that is extremely uh, thorough in, in uh, the number of machines that it emulates and the accuracy in which it emulates them. Um, there's DOSBox, which uh, uh, may be very familiar for anyone who uh, ever runs old DOS software. Uh, it's a very convenient way to do that because it can access the drives on, your, uh, on, on the host machine. Um, there are a few others that, have, uh, 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 that other people have written over the years for, for one purpose or another, including a couple that I've written myself. Um, Barapa is, a, uh, is an emulator that is uh, in progress. It has been a, a, a sort of a long-running project. Um, it's an emulator that I hope you'll be able to uh, uh, sort of reconfigure dynamically. You can uh, write a configuration file that uh, specifies exactly what hardware you want in your emulated machine, and it'll figure out how to sort of wire it all up for you. So if you wanted to take the sound chip from a Commodore 64 and place it in a BBC Micro, you could, uh, you could do stuff like that. And then 86SIM is a very simple, basic uh, emulator that I wrote in order to test uh, a compiler that I was porting, a port of the uh, GCC GNU uh, C compiler, um, targeting the uh, the 8086, and um, none of these have a, uh, a, a accurate uh, CPU cycle timing. Um, the reason for this is that the exact timing of the uh, uh, of the uh, of how long each instruction takes in terms of the the number of clock cycles it takes is not actually documented anywhere. There are, there are documents online that give uh, best case timings for, these, uh, for, for each instruction. Uh, but the, uh, there are a number of uh, reasons why any particular instruction might not take, might take longer than the, the optimal time. Uh, um, a lot of ways in which the uh, other parts of the machine can steal cycles from the CPU. Uh, we'll talk about more, uh, more about that in a minute. Uh, in 2011, I finally got myself uh, an original IBM XT. Uh, this was built in uh, 1984, I believe. And uh, as far as software is concerned, it is uh, pretty much identical to the uh, original IBM PC from 1981, that is the sort of granddaddy of all of the uh, the x86 machines that uh, uh, have taken over the world since, pretty much. Uh, so this machine has a, a 4.77 megahertz Intel 8088 CPU. Uh, it's a 8-bit uh, uh, 
uh, 8-bit bus, but 16-bit uh, uh, CPU internally. Uh, the machine has 640K of RAM. Uh, I, I actually got quite lucky. It was a machine I bought on eBay, and it came with a bunch of uh, expansion cards, including a, a RAM expansion to take the, take the RAM from the 256K that was on the motherboard all the way up to 640K, which, uh, as the saying goes, should be enough for anyone. Uh, I have one uh, five and a quarter inch 360K floppy drive for it. I have some other floppy drives that uh, I keep meaning to fix so I, I can have the, uh, the dual floppy system that was uh, very desirable at the, uh, in the day. Uh, I also bought a, a CGA graphics card for it so that I could, uh, I could play all the CGA games uh, just the way they were meant to be. Um, so CGA graphics, it's a, it's a little less sophisticated than the, the graphics in the Amstrad PC1512 that I started with. In the 640x200 resolution, you can only have two colors on screen at once, or four colors at half the resolution. Uh, but if you plug the machine into uh, a, an NTSC monitor or uh, uh, a, a, an American TV set, you can actually get all 16 colors on screen at once um, uh, at a resolution of about 160 uh, by 200 uh, when I got this machine, it, uh, it didn't have a keyboard, uh, it didn't have any working floppy drive or hard drive, uh, and the only graphics card that it came with was not compatible with the, uh, the one monitor that I had for it. So uh, my first job was to uh, try and figure out how to actually load code onto this machine. Uh, uh, now, the, back in those days, when you bought a, a PC from IBM, it came with the, uh, a great deal of uh, technical uh, documentation. It came with the, uh, uh, the schematics of the entire machine and also the, uh, the, the assembler listing of the BIOS, the, uh, the ROM chip inside that, uh, uh, that actually boots the machine. And looking over these assembler listings, I noticed that IBM had uh, left in there uh, a little something that they, uh, they used in the factory for testing. Uh, for testing the machines as they uh, as they came off the assembly line, uh, a little uh, piece of code that uh, that looks for a particular byte uh, coming in over the keyboard port, and if it sees that byte instead of the normal byte that says "Hey, I'm a keyboard," uh, then it will know that it's not actually a keyboard that's connected to the machine, but uh, IBM's internal manufacturing test device. Uh, uh, and uh, what it does with this test device is it just loads a, a stream of bytes over the keyboard port, uh, dumps them into memory, and then when, the, when that stream is finished, then it just goes and runs them. So it's a, it's a really good way of just getting code onto the machine really quickly. Uh, I started off actually just by plugging an Arduino into the, into the keyboard port to get code onto it. Uh, I have since built this, uh, this little circuit, which is basically the same thing. It's basically an Arduino. It's an 80 mega 328 microcontroller running at 16 megahertz. Uh, the, the irony that this is actually quite a bit more powerful than the PC that it's plugged into is not lost on me. Um, so as well as, the, as well as the Arduino, this has got uh, uh, a pass-through for the, for the actual keyboard. So it plugs into the keyboard port, and the actual keyboard plugs into this. And it's also got a serial port to plug it into a modern machine for, uh, 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 for transferring uh, programs over from a modern machine onto the XT. And uh, there's uh, one more connection here, this little red wire that, uh, that you can see that goes off into the corner. That's actually spliced into the XT's uh, power good uh, line from the power supply. So when the microcontroller pulls this line low, it resets the entire machine, does a complete hard reset. And then in a second or so, it's back at the, uh, the part of the BIOS where it, um, it, it's looking for that byte from the, from the keyboard port. So uh, rather than, uh, uh, some of you may remember that PCs in those days uh, would go through a very long memory test when they, when they booted up. They would count up uh, for each kilobyte of RAM in the machine, it would count up. So if you have all 640K of RAM in an original IBM XT, it actually takes a couple of minutes to, to boot up. But the, uh, the keyboard, uh, the, the, the manufacturing test routine uh, happens before that memory test. So you can actually get the machine uh, running a new program in about a second this way. It's much quicker to, to iterate when you're developing software for it. I've taken this, uh, uh, this, this device and um, uh, it's connected to a, a modern PC in my office. 
And uh, that modern PC is running uh, an Apache web server and uh, some CGI scripts that I wrote myself, which means that anyone anywhere in the world can load, load code onto this XT uh, by using this web interface, reenigny.org slash XT server. Uh, so uh, the, the screenshot that you can see here is just uh, just a web browser that uh, I've uh, 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 sent uh, uh, as a post request uh, a floppy disk image, a 360k floppy disk image containing a DOS and uh, an auto exec bat that just prints itself. So you can uh, uh, you, you can see how that uh, that works. Uh, the XT server does not yet support uh, uh, keystrokes coming from the uh, from the web browser uh, and then sending those over to the uh, over to the XT. That's something I'm, I'm uh, I hope to add at some point. Um, but it's uh, it's useful to uh, for, for non-interactive things. You can you can write a program, stick it on a disk image, uh, send it to the XT server, uh, get the results back. And uh, uh, so this is this is really useful for for emulator authors who uh, want to run experiments on the real hardware to to see what the timings are for various things. Uh, none of them took me up on it, though, so I was uh, 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 left to uh, to figure out these cycle timings myself. Uh, so this is the this is the target that we are trying to uh, make an, a cycle exact emulation of the uh, the Intel 8088, which was uh, the hot new thing in 1979. It uses a, a, a 3,000 nanometer uh, process. Uh, compare that to I don't know what they're down to today: 15 nanometers, 10 nanometers. Um, it has 29,000 transistors compared to the billions in today's CPUs. Uh, it has uh, eight general purpose registers, each of which are 16 bits. Uh, it has a 20-bit uh, memory address space, so it can address a, a whole megabyte of RAM, uh, although normally you, you would only address six, uh, 640K of RAM, and the other, the other 384K is for ROM and peripherals and things like that. Uh, the CPU is actually microcoded internally, so uh, while it's running your program, it's uh, it's also running its own little program and its own special purpose instruction set. Um, the the sort of blue rectangle you can see in the corner of the uh, uh, of this uh, die photograph is actually the the main ROM, uh, which holds the uh, holds the microcode. It's 504 instructions, each of which are 21 bits. Uh, so. Uh, uh, my my purpose in in building this emulator wasn't to run this this original microcode program uh, just to get something with with the same cycle timings so that it would be indistinguishable to software that is running on the on the actual uh, PC. Uh, the the microcode instructions themselves, I haven't actually got a, a dump of them yet. This uh, this die photograph is high enough resolution to be able to see the individual transistors, but it's only the top layer. And uh, I don't want to mess about with fuming nitric acid or whatever you need to do in my house to uh, to actually take uh, the the uh, die photographs of all of the layers and reverse engineer the the, the chip at the gate level as, as some people have done with uh, with chips like the 6502. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, I decided to uh, approach it just by trying to uh, reverse engineer the chip from the outside, run code on it, and. Um, uh, and, and uh, do timings and, and figure out the, uh, uh, the figure out how it works that way to uh, to, to sufficient fidelity. Uh, so here's a, here's a little slide about the uh, the architecture of the uh, the Intel 8088. Uh, the the top half here is the um, the bit that communicates with the bus, uh, and then the bottom half is the uh, the actual execution unit. Which uh, uh, does the it, it, uh, runs that that microcode program? Uh, so the, the the execution unit is you know adding your numbers together or multiplying, uh, you know whatever whatever you've asked the computer to do, and then the top part gets the date gets the program and data in and out of the uh, of the CPU to the memory and other devices on the machine. And the fact that the uh, the fact that these two parts run sort of asynchronously. Uh, and the, uh, either one can be waiting for the other uh, at any point in time, is why the timing of this chip is so complicated and, and it hasn't been done before now. Uh, not only do we have to know how long each instruction takes overall, but also where in the execution of that instruction 
it, uh, it, it asks the uh, bus execution unit to get or put a value to the bus or gets a byte from the prefetch queue that uh, there's a, a four byte prefetch queue in the 8088 which um, uh, uh, queues up uh, bytes of the instruction uh, 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 of the program, uh, the instructions that the execution unit will be running next, uh, in order that the uh, the execution unit won't have to wait for the um, uh, won't have to wait for the bus interface unit for too long, and uh, that does speed things up quite a bit over uh, similar architectures, but it does make the the timings a lot more complicated. Uh, on the, uh, the this diagram that shows the uh, uh, shows all the pins of the chip, you probably can't read it. The text is very small, and I'm sorry for that. But there are two pins, QS0 and QS1, which actually show the status of the prefetch queue, and um, uh, they, they show uh, for each cycle that the uh, uh, that the CPU is executing. It shows whether the queue is uh, is being emptied, whether it's the first cycle of an instruction, whether it's the subsequent cycle of an instruction, or or or, or if it's just uh, if it's just idle. And the reason these pins exist is for the 8088 or 8086 to be able to interface with the 8087 floating point coprocessor. Uh, the floating point coprocessor actually runs alongside the the CPU. Uh, monitors the instruction stream, and if it sees an instruction that is a floating point instruction, it, it, uh, it interrupts and, and uh, hops in and, and does its thing, and then sends the result back to the CPU over the bus. Um, so I wanted to be able to, to read these queue status pins along with everything else that's going on in the machine, so I could see what the queue is doing at each point in the execution of these uh, these instructions. So I ended up building this little ISA card. Um, again, it's, uh, it's uh, based around the 80 mega 328. I, I like that chip. Um, and uh, uh, this time, rather than running at 16 megahertz like a, an Arduino does, the clock is actually taken from the clock on the ISA bus. So it actually runs at 14.318 megahertz, four times the NTSC color carrier frequency. Um, uh, and as well as the, uh, the microcontroller, it also has a, a, a serial port to get the results out to a, a modern machine. And the only other thing on the board is these um, uh, multiplexers. Uh, so there's only so many I.O. pins on the, uh, on the 80 mega 328, and I wanted to be able to, to sample a lot of pins, not just on the, uh, on, on the CPU, the 40 pins of the CPU, but also all the, all the pins of the ISA bus as well. And a few other things that I've uh, I've since added. Uh, why, if you look inside my XT now, there's wires going from this board to all, all over the motherboard, so that I can sample various other lines. Um, so uh, the way that this bus sniffer works is uh, we run the same program multiple times, uh, taking care to ensure that each time we run it, all the timing is exactly the same. So the machine is is put into a known state run the program uh, so many times, uh, once for each set of pins that we want to, to sample. And it works really well. This is a, a dump of the output of the ISA bus sniffer. Uh, the columns on the left show the actual raw data from the, uh, that, that's coming over the serial port from the bus sniffer card. And then on the right, there's the, um, uh, the, the sort of uh, some interpretation that's been done on it. Uh, so it, it shows exactly which instruction is, is uh, starting on which cycle, and it shows the, uh, uh, the, the bus accesses, the reads or the writes to the bus that are occurring at any moment, uh, occurring at each cycle. And, uh, and also when the, uh, when the uh, machine gets uh, interrupted for a DMA transfer, which happens uh, 64,000 times a second for uh, uh, dynamic RAM refresh, uh, that's all shown in the, uh, in the diagram as well. Um, now a little uh, a little side quest. Um, in uh, 2015, I uh, worked with some friends on this uh, uh, this demo scene demo uh, 8088 MPH, which we presented at the uh, revision demo party in Germany, and uh, it, uh, it it kind of blew everyone away with uh, what we were able to uh, uh, able to coax these uh, these old 8088 CGA machines into doing. 
Uh, we wrote a bunch of effects that only work on uh, IBM PCs and XTs uh, because, uh, like Digger, they uh, require the machine to be cycle exact. Um, and uh, uh, we also got we also managed to coax the CGA card into uh, making about a thousand colours rather than the 16 it's normally capable of by uh, uh, using and abusing the uh, NTSC uh, composite colour system. Uh, we also got it to play four channel music on the PC speaker, um, which again is all, all cycle counted. So if you try and run that, uh, that uh, music routine on a, on a modern machine, it will sound very uh, high pitched and, and, and fast like a, a record played back at the wrong speed. Um, so uh, nice thing is that now we have a, an incentive for uh, emulator authors to uh, uh, to try and get their emulators to be cycle exact so that they can run this demo the way it's uh, way it's supposed to be. Because um, of course we did we didn't have a, 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 a cycle exact emulator when we were writing the demo, so we uh, did all our development on real hardware. Um, so I'm still I'm still working on a, a, a cycle exact demo. Uh, cycle exact um, uh, emulator. I call it XTCE, XT Cycle Exact. Um, what I've got at the moment is a, a, a program that just generates a very large number of test cases. Um, it, uh, it tries to test the timing of, of each uh, of the 256 possible opcodes uh, that, you, that the, uh, the CPU can, can execute. Some of these are not even valid opcodes, uh, so I'm even testing the, the timing of uh, illegal instructions. Um, where the operands to the instruction can make a difference in the timing, I'm testing all possible combinations of operands as well. And then also the state of the, uh, the prefetch queue and the bus uh, can make a difference, so I'm testing each possible combination of those. So there's a very large number of, uh, uh, of possible uh, uh, situations that the, the machine can be in. Um, uh, once we've generated all these test cases, we batch them into chunks of 64k at once. Um, we send them over the uh, over that serial link to the um, to the microcontroller to run them on the XT. Uh, and then, if any tests are not, uh, if any of those test cases uh, turn out to have different timing on the real hardware as on the emulator, then it will run the ISA bus sniffer to get a, a trace of exactly what happened on what cycle on that. And then I can com compare it with the equivalent uh, instruction trace on, the, uh, 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 on XTCE and see where the emulator is diverging from the real hardware. And so by iterating through that process a lot of times, uh, about 550 uh, of the tests uh, of the test case, uh, those automatically generated test cases have at some point found a, 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 a bug, a timing problem in, in XTCE. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's now got to the point where uh, uh, you know, millions of these tests are now passing and it's, uh, it's able to go for, for days at a time without, uh, without hitting any failing tests. In fact, the, uh, the limiting factor right now is not the uh, the, the time it takes to uh, to run the tests or, or the or bugs in in the emulator, uh, I'm now running out of memory on the modern machine to actually hold all the tests. Um, so I think what I'm going to have to do is have the uh, uh, maintain two versions of the uh, uh, of the emulator in the same program. So one uh, uh, one will uh, is the one that's that's actually under test, and one is the last known good. Uh, uh, last known good version of the emulator with the, the timings correct as they were known to be so far. Uh, and then I can compare those two and then when we run out of, uh, uh, run out of tests um, that, uh, that we have last known good results for, then we can run them on the, uh, on the real hardware. Uh, as well as uh, the timings of the, uh, the, the bus, uh, the, the way that the bus uh, execution, uh, the, the uh, bus interface unit and the execution unit interact. Uh, another uh, problem that I had is um, the fact that the uh, multiplication and division routines are actually fairly complicated little bits of, uh, of microcode. And um, these, uh, uh, these instructions actually take different amounts of time, a uh, different number of cycles, depending on what numbers you're multiplying together or dividing. 
Um, here's a fun little uh, little picture that I made uh, of that shows how the the the, the timings change depending on what uh, uh, what numbers you you put into these instructions. So on the left is uh, uh, eight bit multiplies. Um, so you've got one number uh, that you're multiplying together on the x-axis, one uh, the other number on the y-axis, and the colour at each point uh, corresponds to the number of cycles that um, that that, that in that multiplication takes. And uh, similarly for, for division over here. Uh, the multiplication one actually wasn't too difficult to figure out. It turns out to be just the one cycle for each one bit in, uh, in one of the operands um, and uh, a, a few other things to do with uh, whether the, uh, a cycle for if the uh, uh, result overflows and um, uh, some cycles if you're doing sign multiplication uh, depending on which of these four quadrants you're in. Uh, so, uh, the, yeah, the multiplication one wasn't too difficult to figure out. The division one took me ages. Uh, I thought I knew how to implement a division algorithm in the same way that a CPU would do it, just in terms of compares, additions, subtractions. Um, but no matter where I put the delays in this, uh, in my own division routine, I could not get the timings to line up. Uh, the, uh, fortunately, I found a, a patent uh, that, uh, uh, that Intel had filed about the, um, uh, the implementation of the 8088 and 8086. And this is a, an extract from the patent that actually shows the division algorithm uh, that, uh, as it is implemented in the microcode. And uh, uh, the, the patent is terribly written. Uh, a whole load of terms in it are never explained anywhere. Uh, there are mistakes all over the place, but after a lot of head scratching and looking at this pattern and trying to figure it, figure out, I, I actually figured out how this division routine works and uh, re-implemented it myself uh, in, in C++ and, uh, and, and got the timings to actually work out. So uh, uh, although I'm not a fan of patterns uh, in general, this one actually worked out uh, pretty handy for me. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the algorithm as implemented in the microcode is, is a bit cleverer than the one that, uh, uh, that I implemented myself. It, uh, it actually manages to do the uh, division with, with fewer temporary registers, which are obviously very important if you're on a, uh, running on a CPU with a very small number of uh, uh, transistors and uh, internal registers. Um, I'm still working on XCCE. Uh, there's still a few more, uh, few more bits to do before I can call it finished. Uh, a number of um, uh, a number of uh, situations where uh, the uh, in, in, uh, invalid instructions. If you're using multiple prefixes at once, um, the, the, there are situations there where that isn't defined. Uh, situations to do with hardware interrupts. Uh, if, if a hardware interrupt comes in, a device needs a in, uh, needs an interrupt servicing. Then, uh, whereabouts in the execution of the, uh, the instruction does that interrupt actually occur? Uh, and then, the, uh, I want to use these uh, 550 or so tests that, that ever failed to make a sort of torture test for other emulators so that they can see how accurate they are. Uh, and then, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of it is, uh, is just implementing you know, the rest of the machine, the, the CGA card, the speaker, keyboard, mouse. A uh, host interface like DOSBox has for you know reading files off your hard disk it would be very useful indeed, and um, and fixing up the, uh, uh, the the timings of the uh, the other peripherals the timer and the interrupt controller DMAs and uh, uh, and the other peripherals. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, there's a few links here to uh, to some of the projects that I've uh, I've talked about. All the code for all of this is on GitHub. So uh, uh, I'm afraid it's all a big mess in one repository. So you'll probably have to email me if you want to find something specific in there. Uh, that's it. Sure. Um. Any quick questions? Anyone? Okay, one here. So, except for your um, demo scene 
code and the digger game. How sensitive are most games to the timing of the XT? Uh, most games are not that sensitive at all. I mean, even uh, games that were written to be uh, only tested on that uh, on that particular. Uh, CPU and run, a, run at a, a, a speed that is governed just by the speed of the CPU. Um, uh, uh, there were a number of games like that, but people played them on faster systems. Uh, they were just more difficult. Um, so it's, it's kind of an academic exercise to, uh, uh, to actually make this uh, uh, cycle exact emulator. It's not very important for running real world software. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, by uh, implementing this emulator, uh, I will sort of spur the development of some uh, software that, that more software running on these old machines that, that is cycle exact, that does require that, that uh, 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 cycle exact timing, um, and can therefore push the machine uh, uh, much closer to its, uh, its theoretical limits than, uh, than you, uh, uh, it would do if you are uh, relying on uh, uh, other parts of the hardware, the timer interrupt and so on, to, to do your timing. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew Jenner. Um.